Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about reconnecting and we will be using essential oils. If you have lavender or peppermint or and peppermint, even geranium, if you have geranium with you, go ahead and grab them and we will be going through that. And thank you so much. We have um, a few people here. Some of you were at the event and some of you were not. So I'm going to talk about uh, from the beginning to the end. It's one hour. I'm going to talk fast because I have another Zoom at 9.30. And welcome. Bring your notepad and we're going to have fun. Okay. Uh, can you see? I think I can present on this because once I present, you won't be able to see it. Okay. Can you see my screen? I won't be yep. able to see you. Yeah. Um, talk to me if, um, if you have questions. Okay. So this was the event. Oops, sorry. Oh, wrong one. Hold on. I am so sorry. Uh, this one. We had a the event at Horseshoe a couple of weeks ago. It was really fun. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in to talk about reconnecting and then um personalities, attachment personalities, and how to use an oil, couple oils, three oils, and so on and so forth. But first of all, what is reconnect? Reconnect actually means back, connect back together. We kind of chose that name. Well, I chose that name for the um, event because I felt that uh, we have been locked up for about three years and it's time to get back together. Um, it is reestablishing a bond of communication and emotion. As much as we are doing that for connecting with people around us, my main um, purpose was the connection between ourselves. I'm going to mute. When you come in here, you got to mute. Uh, okay, Yiru is from Taiwan. That's why I switched to Chinese. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm talking about reestablishing a bond of communication and your emotion within ourselves. So this is what we're going to concentrate on um, this morning's Zoom. Um, we are in a very disconnecting world, not just with, with each other, but also within ourselves. How many of us do feel that, you know, a lot of times you're conflicting yourself? Do you feel that? Sometimes you feel like you're bipolar. One moment, uh, when I was raising my kids, I feel like I was bipolar because one moment I'm like uptight and let's get things done. Another moment is like, oh, I love you. And then one moment I turn around, it's like, don't do that. Why do you do this? It's like, I can switch 10 different emotions in two minutes. I, I honestly honestly feel like I'm a bipolar mom. So I in this in this case, I feel that I'm disconnecting between myself due to the circumstances and due to how I can regulate and handle the situation in my living space. So um, I talk about these <laughs> uh, brainwave and stuff from the beginning. I'm going to go through it quickly so that we can concentrate on the personality, um, attachment personality. Um, but we got to understand the basis of when a child was born, when you and I were born, not too long ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of us have lived half our lives. But anyways, when we were born, the energy centers of our body were active. The brain waves were working. And we were going to talk about the energy centers in the later slides. What this really means is we were born into perfection. And we will slowly develop as a person as we grow. So how does it work? When a child is just starting to stand up and maybe starting to take the first step, that is two essential signals that the child has to regulate. The first one is the child is constantly thinking, is this a threat? Is this safe? Can I move on? And then they're looking around and they are understanding that the environment is safe and therefore, everything is well, we can relax. But I think some of us are tiger moms or um, there was an English version, but I forgot now what it's called, like a OCD mom. You know, when your child starts to stand up, you'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 wait, 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 
it. Okay, okay. Put your hand here. Take your right foot. No, no, no. Use your left foot and make sure. Oh no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Don't go there. I haven't childproofed it. You know, don't go. Don't go near the stairs. You're going to fall off. Seriously, I have trouble swimming because every time I get into my bathing suit, my mom will say, "Be careful! Don't go so deep because the wave is going to take you and you go die." And I was like, "Wow." If I go swim, I'm going to die. So I always have this, this inferior uh, thought that, oh, I'm going to go deeper and I'll go die, right? So as the child starts to stand, the child is now thinking, is this safe? And um, they will try to move forward. Also, we will see some people have some developmental... Um, sorry, I got to let someone in. Maybe someone can be my uh, co-host. I don't even know how to do that now. Hold on. How do I put it oh, here? Okay, never mind, I'll just do it. Um, so a lot of times a child is standing up trying to walk and because the mother is so controlling, the child is always looking for the mother to give a signal. Can I do it? Is it safe? Can I walk now? And then the mom says, yes, yes. And when um, I, was, I was a Chinese mom, you know, Chinese mom is always hovering over the child, almost walking step by step behind the child. So when this child starts to grow up, the child will be lacking the ability to find the signal in her surrounding or his surrounding to see if it's safe or not. So the child is always looking for recognition, always looking for approval. Is this the place where it's safe? Can I do it? Can I walk? Can I go now? Have you ever seen a 50-year-old man or woman always looking for approval? Is this good? Is this good? They're always coming to you and they're showing you what they have done and what they have not done and they're looking for approval. Come on, am I talking to myself or have you, have you met someone like that? Yes, yes, I see some head nod, all right? So <laughs> as we grow, just about when you are being toilet trained, all right? There are four independent actions that happen in our body. The first one is, this action is to open up. This happens when you feel safe to trust. And this stage happens that, you know, you're, you're, you're learning how to regulate, to eliminate, to, to let things go. You're, you're in that stage of growing. Um, the second action is, all right, if this is a safe place that I can trust, then I can learn to enjoy. I can learn to have pleasure. I will have fun. I will have humor. And the corner, this is the cornerstone of health because this is your self-worth, is that your worthiness on how you learn to take in the energy. However, if the child feel that this is a threat, there will be an immediate reaction to close it because this closeness become a protection. You will set, definitely go on to a self-defense and it will lead on to your inability to connect in the form of pleasure, to give and take in relationships with yourself and with others. This is the part where we really need to, um, to go back, not, not to go back to psychoanalyze, but to really see where we have been. I told this story in the event, but I'm going to tell you again because I chose this little girl because she's Asian looking because I've, I really identify with this little girl. Um, when I was around that age, my mom, my parents were very busy. I hardly see them. And we had a nanny that I call her my mama. Many people think that she's my mom. She's not. She was a hired um, maid to take care of us when we were growing up. And my mama um, took care of, of us. I was in the toilet. I was just being toilet trained. And um, I remember when, when I was done and I asked for my mama or my brother and sisters to come and help me. And nobody came. And I kept screaming and calling for someone to help me. And nobody came. By the time the person, someone came to me, I remember by that time, it was actually my mom and my mama both came. I was not able to stand or walk for hours after. 
So that just shows that I have been sitting on the toilet for a long, long time. If I remember correctly, it was in the evening when someone finally came to me. I was probably there all day. And I, um, because I'm very open to coffee time, so I can tell you, I have trouble. I have trouble with taking pleasure. I have trouble with having fun in my life. I have trouble with self-worth, which I will tell you a lot more in our next uh, few weeks in our coffee time about self-worth of what um, the many failures that I have in life because I'm lack of self-worth, which I'm learning tremendously now. But I think it goes back to this developmental stage where I wasn't able to feel safe to trust and I didn't learn how to enjoy and have fun and take pleasure in life. And uh, in the contrast, I learned to protect myself. And I don't know. I, I, I give. I, I know how to give. I don't know how to take. Have you guys ever given me a gift? Anyone here actually given me a gift? Oh, I'm not saying this to, 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 do, to do that. But you will see that I'm very awkward. When you give me a gift, like when Lonette gave me the rocks that she drew that says pure senses, I was awkward. I was like, but in the back of my head, I was thinking you actually took time to look for the rock and look for the logo and find the colors and painted it and remember to give it to me. You know what I mean? It's like, it takes a lot of steps. And when I get it, I, I am awkward. I'm so weird. So this is what I am going to learn. And I hope Maybe if you identify with me, that you will join me in learning that. I'm going to move on here. That relationship and pleasure, they go side by side. This stage actually help us um, to set boundaries. And it is the cornerstone of healthy relationship being developed. And we continue to develop your own identity from when you are toilet trained or when you are first starting to walk, right up to the age of 17 or 20 years old. <laughs> this is when you combine uh, the first two self-esteem and you will create consciously and subconsciously who you really are. And a lot of times we hesitate to become who we are, um, we are meant to be because of some childhood attachment issues. So here are the slides that was um, missed during the event. So back in the 1950s, there were a couple um, psychologists. They came up with a theory that's called attachment personality. This is a person's attachment style that is shaped and developed in early childhood and in response to our relationship with our earliest caregiver. So let's dive in and take a quick look and feel free to take pictures, okay? <clears throat> there are four attachment personalities. You have the secure um, attachment personalities, the ambivalent, the avoidant, and the disorganized. We all want to be secure. This is where we want to be. That means it is easy for me to get close to others. Who thinks you are secure? <laughs> I can tell you right now, I am not. I don't get close to people. I always have a wall and I'm learning. I'm learning and I hope you will learn with me. Avoidant, this is who I am. I am, um, I prefer not to depend on others. And I really prefer not to have people dependent on me either. <laughs> you do you. I do me. And the saying says, you do you boo, right? So this is where I would try to avoid and I try to hold, I have to hold myself together. And then we have another type of attachment personality that is the ambivalent. Ambivalent is always worry about I am not good enough. Sometimes we have a few of that together. Or you could switch. Uh, sometimes you're really secure as a mother. So you are, you are good with connecting with your child but then to um to your teachers or i don't know to your to your colleague you are like don't talk to me leave me alone 
while with your spouse you are ambivalent you could be i'm very i'm not good enough am i good enough to do this am i can i make this meal good did i clean the house good enough you're always worried about that and then the fourth type of attachment personalities is the disorganized the disorganized personality you earn you yearn to have a close relationship but you are very scared of being hurt Okay, so let's dive in a little bit more. First of all, you can actually go on traumasolutions.com to Dr. Diane Pulley Heller. She has a quiz that you can take to see what um, personality you are. So a, a lot of this information are adopted, adapted from um, why you love, feel, act the way you do. Um, some of these teachings are from Dr. Diane Puller, from Peter Levine. So you could look into more. This is just a high level understanding. So, um, but I think um, for what we need, a high level is pretty good for now. Um, don't overwhelm yourself with things that you don't really um, need to, right? So let's dive in each of the personality and take a quick look. So let's look at the secure attachment personality, which is whoop, whoop. This is the perfect one, okay? This person has positive self and positive to others. The self dimension is, I am worthy of love. Actually, when I say that, it is, um, I, I'm, I'm learning. Oops, sorry. What happened? I was trying to approve Diana to come in and, ew, hold on. I'm going to go back here. All right. Can you see now? Am I back? Okay. So this personality, oh, I was saying that I am worthy of love, right? Guys, in the last few months, I am working on self-love. You're going to see a new version of Jasmine because I am worthy of love. I'm going to share with you in the next few weeks and also a book called Worthy of Love that I have been studying day and night. It is amazing. Huh? You, need to say, you need to keep saying that every day. I am worthy of love. Can you and see my eyes? Yes, you. <laughs> okay. I think I'm moving to secure attachment personality. But let's take a look, okay? The self-dimension is I am capable of getting the love and support I need. I almost want to cry right now because this is such an awakening for me. And I hope you will too. Once come, come continue to come on to coffee time. I have so much to share with you. But let's concentrate on this so that I'm not a squirrel. I'm not squirreling, okay? The other dimension with this uh, secure personality is that others are willing and able to love me. Isn't that beautiful? Who actually think that way? That others are willing and able to love you. Did it, uh, I can tell you right now, it's not an easy way to say that. Who has trouble with that? Who? Yeah, it is hard. I have trouble most of my life, but not anymore. Not, we are going to move down this rabbit hole in the next few months. Sounds good? So the secure personality can trust people very easily. It's attuned to your emotions. You learn how to regulate how you feel. You, you don't have the poker face. You can learn how to feel. Um, you can communicate your upsets directly. You don't have to play games. You don't have to go around the bush. And you lead with cooperative and flexible behavior in relationship. Guys, I want to marry someone who is secure, man. Life will be so easy, right? So now let's move on to the avoidant personality. All right, fasten your seatbelt with me. So this person has a positive self, but negative others. Maybe this person has been hurt tremendously. Self-dimension is, yes, I am worthy of love and I'm capable of getting the love and support I need. However, the others are either unwilling or incapable of loving me. That is sad that I live my life mostly like that. I keep to myself thinking, I don't need your love. I don't need your help. I don't need you. That's fine. Leave me alone. But you want something? I can give it to you. You know, 
Um, the others are not trustworthy. And that came from many, many failure in relationships that, that I've come to a place where I feel that they are not reliable when it comes to meeting my needs, that my needs were never met, that it come to a point that I don't even want to express my need anymore because I, I just don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to open up myself and not that that don't get the fulfillment of my needs anymore. How many, how many one feels the same, like similar, that you have that, right? It's like, okay, I'm self-sufficient. I'm good here. This is my space. You do you, boo. I do me, right? And this person will downplay the importance of relationship. Um, I, I prefer to talk to chicken, you know what I mean? Or my dog. <clears throat> and it's usually extremely self-reliant. You know that I prefer to do things myself versus delegating and ask people to do it because then it involves me to work with people, right? I just do it myself, right? So it can be, become more vulnerable when there is a big crisis. That's when we will break. When something big happens, you will break. So that is the avoidant personality. Who thinks you are somewhat avoidance-ish? <laughs> ah, here you go. So let's look at the ambivalent. The ambivalent has a negative self, but positive others. You are thinking to yourself, I am not worthy of love and I'm not capable of getting the love I need without being clingy or angry. I know it's like some, I mean, when we were younger, when we first starting to date, you become either like clingy, right? Well, I was never a clingy girlfriend. I was like, you do you boo, <laughs> you know? Like some of us can be very clingy. Or even when you first get to um to, to get to know some new friends, you become really clingy. You open up and you want to talk about yourself over and over and over again. However, but your other dimension is it's very positive that other people can meet your needs but might not do so because of my flaw. So the self-confident, the self-impression of this person is down. Others are trustworthy and reliable, but might abandon me because of my worthlessness. Have you ever worked with people or lived with people like that? That no matter how much you love on them, they don't seem to have the tank filled because there is a leak somewhere no matter how much love you pour on them, it never fills up. It never is enough. It's not because you don't love them enough, because they don't have the self-worth to accept the love that you have for them. So it's preoccupied or anxious is what they normally do. And uh, it has a sensitive nervous system. They get triggered very easily and they struggle to communicate their needs directly. So they go around the bush and you don't really know what they really want because it's go round and round and round. It tends to act out when triggered, uh, trying to make your partner jealous, try to say things that is indirect just to, just because we are, we are feeling unworthiness that you're worried of being abandoned, but you will try to go around it. Or you try to fish for, um, for compliment, but you can't tell them directly Am I really beautiful? But you will be like, oh, is this nice on me? Oh, is this nice on me? Oh, should I get a, a, a 10? Or should I do this? And when your partner doesn't give you the right answer, it, you act out because it's a trigger. You know what I mean? So that could be an ambivalent personality. And finally, the fourth one is the disorganized personality. <clears throat> disorganized person <clears throat> has very negative self and negative others. So you don't feel that you are worthy, you don't, you're not worthy of love. You're not capable of getting the support and love that you need without being angry or clingy. And the others are not available to meet my needs. They are not trustworthy. They are not reliable. They can be abusive and I deserve it. This will remind me of the child learning to walk. And the child is like, mom, is this okay? You know how a little child looking for mom to have an eye contact? 
but she did not get the eye contact or she get the stare or the dirty look and this child is really confused am i good to go or am i not good to go do i deserve your time or do i not deserve your time um can can i trust that eye that give me that can i trust that look um do i walk down here am i going to fall am i going to fall in the deep waters and die you know all these things is going through and you grow up in a place where you're not sure of who you are and you're not sure of who everything are what everything is and you are very dependent in relationship than avoidant or dismissive. You're always clingy and trying to get approval, trying to get understanding, or basically it's approval from someone, but you're not getting it. So there is a very strong fears of rejection. Any look from someone, any words from someone will be, oh, are they rejecting me? Are they rejecting me? Is there a rejection? Are they going to leave me now? Did I do something that um that they're going to leave me now? Oh, this is my only chance. Like, have I done something? You're always worrying about that. And a very low self-esteem. Very low. When you have low self-esteem, your whole foundation is not firm, right? So it has high anxiety in relationship. So these are the four attachment personalities. We, we are not just one or two. Sometimes we are we play different hats in different um different environments. Like I mentioned earlier, you could be a very secure mom. You are an amazing mom, but you are a horrible lover. You are great with your business, but you're terrible in your romantic life. You know, you're like you 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 wear different hats. So I would love for us to think through and get into a little bit more understanding of who you are, do the quiz and find out. But our purpose today is to find this who we are and to reconnect, not just with the relationship around us, with work, with um, family, with children. You know, some people have a lot of regrets with your child. Maybe you have your child when you were younger and you didn't know how to love on them. Some people, maybe you have your child older and now you're too old to love on them. I'm just kidding. I have my child in my 30s, so I'm, I am I feel really old. Um, but most of all, it's a reconnection between yourself. I am very, very honored that I started learning about this last year, not too long ago, because I saw there were many failures in my life in relationship. I'm very strong at work. I think I'm a very good mother, but everything else, I suck. <laughs> so I want to be a secure personality. I want to move towards that. And I hope by learning this together, we can learn, we can grow together. And I, I went a little further from just learning from Dr. Diane Puller Heller or Peter Levine and so on and so forth. I um I went into the science. I went into more about uh, how our brain works because I want to understand more. So just bear with me to go into science about it, okay? So in this part of our brain, it is... um called amygdala it's right inside i can't even show you where it is you have to put a pin that goes right through to your head to find it it is right here it's called the amygdala the amygdala is a stress detector detect from where detect from our five senses when we see some a danger when we hear danger when we touch when we uh taste when we smell danger that's when it signals out to the amygdala. Say, hey, amygdala, there is stress coming up. And then the amygdala will immediately send a, a signal to the hypothalamus and say, hey, upstairs, there is stress. Let's secrete some hormone. We call that the CRH. And this is a mind and body connection. When this hormone is released, it will go downstairs to the pituitary gland. The pituitary will then release the ACTH down to the adrenal glands. And then the adrenal glands will release cortisol 
to go up. And we call that the black hormone. Cortisol is the stress hormone. That's when we start to, whoa, there is stress. We've got to get going. So basically, <coughs> when that happened, our hypothalamus, oh, I want to change this because I saw this. It's string, S-H-R. This is string, right? Yeah. It will start to shrink. Our hypothalamus will shrink and will affect our short-term memory and our learning. How many of you feel that you have really low short-term memory and you find that, oh, I can't really learn a lot of things? This could be because your hypo hypothalamus is constantly re re receiving stress hormone from the amygdala because you're constantly living in high stress. That's why you have short-term memory and have difficulty learning. Our children have a lot of that uh, issues as well. Now, when this happens, our amygdala actually swells up. The amygdala is the reptilian brain. It controls our emotions such as fear, anxiety, guilt, shame, lust. The state of fear and arousal, that all comes from the amygdala. This will instantly put us into the survival mode. That's also when severe anxiety and panic attacks hit us right away. So then it will get us into this fight and flight. We are constantly running, 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 and we do not think about our digestion. We do not think about rest and digest. Because we, we, when we are in fight and flight, we cannot rest and digest. And we talk about this topic many, many times. So I'm going to skip up here, right? So we know that our childhood has a lot of influence of who we become, but we cannot turn, black the, turn back the clock. So don't be going to your parents' graveyard and start yelling at them, why didn't you wipe my bum when I call for help? Okay, so don't do that. You, our parents did the best that they can. Don't do that. But we can learn how to deal with some of this trauma in our life. But first of all, let's identify what trauma is. I have the pictures of horses because back in the 60s, actually in Toronto, there was a barn that was burned. And there were 60 some horses that ran out of the burning barn. But more than half of them ran back into the burning barn and they died. I need to find out the name of the barn. I don't remember the details. But what happened is because the barn was the safe place. When that barn started to burn, they knew they have to leave. But after they have left, they do not know where to go. So they went back to the burning barn because that was the safe place. In the past few years, when we were locked at home, there were many trauma that happened to many people. When trauma happened to your safe place, which is your home, that is traumatic experiences. We all have been through really high traumatic experiences. My hope and desire is that you will not run back to the burning barn, that you would seek help. There are many, many uh, psychologists, there are many counselors that you can help. And if you need to reach out to some, I have been seeing um, some good, good uh, counselors. I can, reckon, I can recommend some to you. But let's see. But for me, to, for, truthfully, I have found great help with essential oils. Um, I started doing the Freedom Kit as well, and I will talk about the Freedom Kit later, but I'm really, really learning lot, lots. So here is um, what can, <clears throat> how can essential oils help us? First of all, we understand that uh, we have five senses, sense of sight, touch, smell, hearing, and taste. Out of five senses, other than the sense of smell, all the other four senses they go straight to the frontal lobe. When you see something, touch something, hear something, or taste something, it actually goes straight to your front cortex, frontal lobe cortex, where you would analyze what you taste, what you see, what you feel, what you hear, and then you make a decision. But the sense of smell do not do that. What happened is the sense of smell 
it actually gathers the particles of the smell uh, of the fragrance and it gets sucked into the olfactory nerves. And then it goes to the back where the limbic system is. In the limbic system, there is this whole beautiful, all the different glands working together. And they are the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the thalamus. The hypothalamus is responsible to secrete hormones that stimulates or suppress the release of the hormones in the pituitary, pituitary gland. They actually control your water balance, your sleep, your temperature, your appetite, and your blood pressure. No wonder some people who are on high stress, your blood pressure is high. Maybe you can work towards the hypothalamus. Well, the amygdala regulates anxiety, aggression, fear conditioning, emotional memory, and social connection. A lot of us goes into the social avoidance, the connect condition of avoidance, because we just we, we're not able to regulate that anymore. <clears throat> And then it also goes into the hippocampus where long-term memory is affected. So a lot of us have problem with short-term memory. We can also work with that. Thalamus is relaying sensory and modal signals as well as regulating consciousness and alertness. Many times our reaction is subconscious. You know, when I say, hey, Tara Lee, I'd like you to share a testimony. Tara Lee, the first thing she thinks to herself is, oh, no, I can, I can, I can. Oh, no, I'm not good enough. Oh, no, I can't do that. And it goes right back to her getting, oh, hold on. I'm trying to find that slide here. Trying to get back to, oh, I am not good enough. I am, where is this? Uh, downplay, oh, here, where? Um, uh, I am, where is the one that's, I'm not good enough? No, not this one. I think it's this one. Yeah. This one is, I am not good enough to share the testimony. You go back to the ambivalent and then you go back to the disorganized personality because you just feel, oh, I can't share testimony. I'm not good. I cannot articulate because that's when your mind regulates right away. You go right back to your subconscious mind. Because when you were growing up between the age of zero to two, it was your delta brainwave that is being regulated. And in this brainwave, you do not manipulate, you do not think of a way to get your way. You are actually observing. And when you're observing when someone loves you, when your mom comes to hug you, a lot of skin to skin, a lot of pers personal development, and then you're, you develop a subconscious mind full of self-worth you know that when you have a need, your need is met. You know that when you have a connection uh, need, you're able to connect with someone. You learn how to receive love and you learn how to love. That become your subconscious. That become who you really are. Unfortunately, not every one of us have that amazing uh, childhood. So we will have to relearn that. And we know that essential oils have tiny, tiny molecules. So we're going to learn how it will work. So we will be using these three oils to facilitate emotional release in this area. But first of all, let's talk about Young Living Essential Oils. Our oils are actually therapeutic grade. It was planted by God in the garden. And it's not like some other oils that we buy that were made by man in the lab. This is the fundamental reason why you do not touch any other brand of essential oils. For me, I will never touch any oils, no matter how good they say they are. I will only use Young Living. And I can go through that another day. Why? <laughs> okay, so how fast can essential oils work? Um, if I were to ask everyone now to just smell an oil, and I'm going to set my alarm now for 20 minutes. And my alarm will sound in 20 minutes and hopefully in 20 minutes, I will end our talk. <laughs> All right. So smell an oil, whatever oil that you want, just smell it. Because in 22 seconds, hmm, it will have gone to your brain. And the, this is huge because for a molecule to get to your brain, not every molecule can do that because it passed through the blood-brain barrier. In two minutes, it will be found in your bloodstream. 
And in 20 minutes, it will reach the trillion cells in your body. That means it goes down to the cellular level. And what does that all mean? It means that it will bring oxygen to your brain, carry oxygen and nutrients to the bloodstream, into your organs, and the rhythm of these oils will resonate with our organs to rejuvenate us from the inside out. This is huge. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to jump into the how effective are oils. So there are hundreds of constituents found in a drop of oils. And each drop of oils changes. But there are main three that I'd like you to get familiar with. The first one is phenol, the second one is sesquiterpenes, and the third one is monoterpenes. What they do is the phenol part of the oil clear receptor sites. Sesquiterpenes delete bad programming and monoterpenes reprogramming good memory. I remember it was 2014 or 2015. I hear that Gary Young, the founder of Young Living, was going to teach emotional release and raindrop in Croatia. And I was like, whoa. I want to go and learn from him. So, I, and I was broke at the time. So I gathered all the money that I don't have and I was able to buy an air ticket to fly into Croatia. But I didn't have enough money to stay at the Four Seasons Hotel where the event was. So I stayed across the street at the Pink Inn. Thank God it was safe and clean. Anyways, um, I was the first one that arrived at the event and I just cannot wait to hear Gary Young speak. And the first day he came on stage, I was sitting right in front, waiting for him to speak. And he says, essential oils can change your DNA. And I was like, he is a quack. And I can't even afford to go home now. And I was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I am broke. But since I'm here, I'm just going to sit through. And you know what? For the next five days, I started crying, snorting, drooling. They're all mixed together. I don't even know what is what anymore because it really opened up my world to understand what essential oils can actually do for us. When we use this oil, it's not just some good smelling oil. It goes through to clear receptor sites of our body. A lot of us have diseases such as diabetes and heart disease and so on and so forth. It's not because there was no insulin in our body. There is insulin. The insulin are the messenger. They are the hormones. They were going through the cells, but the receptor sites of the cells were blocked. So they were floating around and they couldn't communicate. They could not connect with each other and therefore, they could not talk to each other. And therefore, you have to inject insulin. You think that you have diabetes. You have type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And we're going to talk about that another day because it's a lot more to that because they're two different diabetes, right? But anyways, <clears throat> but essential oils could actually clear the receptor sites so that they can see each other and they can talk and they can connect to each other. <clears throat> and all the bad programming that we have experienced when you were sitting on the toilet, when no one came to you to clean your butt, um, when you were looking for approval, but no one came to give you the approval, right? Those are bad programming. But oil that's high in sesquiterpenes can delete those bad programming. And then finally, oils that's high in monoterpenes, they can reprogram good programming. It can change your DNA. This is what Gary Young was saying. And I was like, wow. And you know what, guys? I have, in July, I would have used Young Living for 10 years. I have become the person that I would never thought I will. My eyes are opened. My heart is open. And I am worthy of love. I am worthy to give and receive love. Come on, I'm ready for love, guys. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So we're gonna, I'm going to flip to the oils very quickly so that we can... Um, I have 15 minutes. And let me see how much... Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk fast, okay? So if you have lavender, you can start looking at your lavender. You don't have to use it first. But 
in the University of Miami, they have that study that shows that by inhaling lavender, you increase the beta waves in the brain. When beta is increased, it heightens your relaxation. That's why everyone says, oh, you can't sleep, use lavender. And that is truth to it because lavender will help you relax. In 2001, in Osaka Kyoku University study, it found that lavender reduced mental stress and it increases alertness. So and you're think, saying, oh, it can relax you and it can increase alertness? Yes, because lavender is an adaptogen. Adaptogen means it adapts to what you want it to do for you. This is the amazing thing about essential oils. It's not a medication that is made in the lab that is only made for one thing. It makes to lower your sugar level. It makes to lower your stress. It makes you this and that. Lav uh, essential oils, it adapts to what your body needs. If you need to sleep, it relaxes you. If you need to pay attention, it increases your alertness. So some people actually use lavender before they go to the gym. And they have so much power working out at the gym because of lavender. So what we want to do with lavender is you can stimulate the parasympathetic, which is your rest and digest. Remember earlier, we were in this fight and flight. Oh, where's, where did it go? Uh, I just deleted it. Oh, no, no, here, there. No. We were in this constant fight and flight. And honestly, I don't have to do a scan. I don't have to tell you, you are on a fight and flight. I am on a fight and flight. Put me behind the wheels. I am on a fight and flight. But actually, I'm getting better now, okay? I'm actually driving a lot more powerfully because I've gained more confidence. So what we want to do is we want to regulate the para um, sympathetic system by putting lavender on the back of your ears where the mastroid bone is. Let me get back to that page right here. Just put it right there. <clears throat> when you apply lavender in the mastroid bone, it helps stimulate the rest and digest state of nervous system. And after that, you can smell it. Hmm. Can you smell the dirt and the leaves? This is young living. You don't get this anywhere else. Don't try to fool yourself to save a few bucks. It's not worth it. <laughs> Use your young living oils. And I'm going to move on to the next oil. In the next oil, we're going to use peppermint. Peppermint release headache, depression, sadness, grief, frustration, anger. It also increased the body's ability to breathe more deeply, it clears repressed emotion, and it releases tears. A lot of us have shallow breathing. Like just concentrate sometimes and watch your breathing. Shallow, shallow. Because you can't get, you can't get caught up with life. So we're going to put it in a point called the letting go point. Is your lung one, Zhong Fu is the Chinese name, is located right at your collarbone right here, um, right in front of the collarbone right here. Can you can you see? So um put a drop. Oh my peppermint is empty. Well, maybe I can feel get a few drops. Okay, so you just get some peppermint and put it on lung one right here. You could press it and it's a little tender. Okay, and you could actually press it in for three counts, release it for three counts, press it in and release. And you could breathe and release and do it on the other shoulder as well because we do have two points here. So put it down and press. I find myself pressing on this point a lot. I sometimes go on both together, press in and release. You breathe, breathe out. Press on in and release. You breathe out. And then by doing that, you're releasing everything that's holding you back. The grief, the sadness. Maybe some of us are feeling frustrated. You're angry. You're depressed. So just breathe it and release what doesn't serve you in a positive and progressive way. Okay, I'm going to... um move on because of time. 
Um, I want to talk about geranium. This is an amazing oil. It's called the oil of love and trust. Geranium restores confidence in the innate goodness of others and in the world. This is especially for those of us who are avoidance and abilivant um, or disorganized that we have not ambivalent, ambivalent is not, it's just avoidance and disorganized personality. We have almost lost confidence in the world. We have lost trust and we have lost the ability to receive from the people around us. We become powerless. We're unwilling to take responsibility for yourself or for your life. You feel defeated. You feel stuck. You're not in the present time. And maybe you live in a lot of blame. You feel like you're powerless and you're a victim. Geranium opens things up for us. It helps us to restore the confidence that we have lost. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about where to put geranium. There is no specific point because all of us are different. And I'm going to explain to you how and why. So we have a few main glands in our body. It starts from the bottom where the pubic bone is. That is adrenal glands. And then it moves up a little bit. If you put your fingers at the um, your belly button. Oh, anyways, you can see my belly button anyways. Um, you put your fingers. If this is your belly button, you put it down four fingers width. That will be your sacra. Okay. Okay. Maybe I will show you since we are here. So here's your belly button. My belly button is here. Four fingers width right here. That's my sacra. That is your sexual gland. That is the gland that really um, define who you are as a woman, who you are as a man. And some people's the sexual gland is blocked. So that's why they are they are looking for answers of who they really are. Um, the pancreas gland is four fingers width above the belly button. So um, the belly button is here and then it's four fingers width right here. So it's right around where the rib is right here. That's your solar plexus. That's also your pancreas gland. And then your thymus is where um, the, called the bone right here. I used to say where your nipples, like parallel to your nipples. And then I realized, mm, depending how many children you have had, uh, they may not be up there. <laughs> so I would say go with the bones. That is not going to wrong. Not, not going to go wrong. And then you have your thyroid and then you have your pituitary and then you have your pineal. Your pineal is where the tip of the ear, you draw a line right here. That is your pineal. So it's not where the, 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 whatever you call that is, that's too far back. It's right in the tip right here. Okay. So with this, um, there is, um, there are, these are the power points. Some people call it the chakra. Some people call it power points. Scientifically speaking, they are the neural endocrine system. They are the neural endocrine power point. <coughs> so you have the space, the sacra, solar plexus, the heart, the throat, the brow, and the crown. And what do they do? This is the body connection. The base, the adrenal glands is connected to your kidneys and your skeleton. So some people have bone issues, osteoporosis or arthritis, or arthritis is joint. But anything to do with that skeleton area is connected to your base. And then the sacra is your bladder uh, body connection. Um, let me, um, oh, what happened? Okay, I can do this. <laughs> oh no, what happened here? One second, guys. Moment, moment. All right. Can you see my screen now? Every time I try to let people in, that's when uh, I got mixed up here. Okay, here. All right. So um, can you see my screen? Where the body is? Where we, where we were with the body connection? Yes? Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm not touching the mouse now. Okay. So as you can see, the solar plexus, which is the pancreas gland, it is connected to your stomach, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas. Does anyone have stomach problem? Do you have liver problem? Maybe gallbladder, maybe pancreas? You know that's where you want to put your geranium. Put it at the solar plexus. You open it up there. Or maybe you have heart and circulation, lung. 
or your throat, you always have sore throat, you have thyroid problem, your jaw, your mouth, put it right there. So this is where you, you could start knowing where to put your oils. Let's go a little deeper. What is the emotional connection? Okay. A lot of people, they have the skeletal issues because the skeleton is, is the base to support your body, right? If your, your frame is not supported, then your whole house is not going to be very um, steady. That is your base. That is your, that's your security and your support system. So maybe you don't have good support system growing up or in your life. Your husband is not supporting you. You don't have a sense of security. That's when you start getting bone issues. Put your geranium right where the base is. So you put it, it's where your pubic bone is in the front. And in the back is where your tailbone is. We put oils in the front on all these points. That is the conscious mind. We also can put them on the back. That is your subconscious. So I actually go to front and then I have that stick that I use and I just roll it up the back and it's really good. You can put geranium right there, okay? Um, just be careful what oil you put there. You don't want to put oregano or cinnamon, right? That is not going to feel too good, okay? Yesterday, I put uh, Christmas spirit on my chest. I didn't realize Christmas spirit has clove in it. My whole chest turned red and was so hot. I didn't dilute it because I kind of liked that feelings. So I just, oh, <laughs> burning heart. Anyways, um, I should get going soon. So I'm going to finish up because the Chinese people are coming in now. All right. <laughs> Maybe you feel that your heart is where the problem is. You always have heart issues. You have circula circulation issues. You're breathing. Your lung has issue. Emotionally, it is connected to your ability to love, care, respect, and the ability not to care and love others, but to receive love. This is where many of us have problems. Well, no, some people have trouble loving on people. I have trouble receiving. And I just declared it earlier, I'm going to re start receiving love, right? And you are going to start receiving love as well. So... How about someone that have throat issues all the time? Maybe you have difficulty speaking your truth. You have to speak politically correct because you don't want to lose your job because you want to keep the peace and harmony in your home and you have to be really careful on uh, what you say, what you don't say, what you do, what you don't do and so on and so forth. So after this, you can take a picture because um, I don't have time to um, go through in details. So the bodily appearance, when that happens is, you know, these are all the possible signals that it will show up. So you are feel free to take a picture right now as we move on. <coughs> so where do you put your geranium? De decide where you want to work on. Pick one spot and try to get on that as you go. Um, or if you're like me, just put some like five or six drops of geranium in your hand and then you just start from your base and draw a straight line to go up and then you know those stick that I, I bought back from Taiwan by the way I ordered another hundred of them I will bring them back in October and then you put geranium in the roller and you just broom, just roll it all the way up so you're covering your conscious mind and your subconscious mind because your subconscious mind was developed when you were an infant between the age of zero to two, when your delta mind, your delta brain wave is looking, looking to see your surrounding, is it safe? Mommy's here. Um, if I am hungry, am I being mad? You know, I absolutely hate some of the uh, sleep training books because when I became a mom, I read a lot of books. Um, I didn't have parents in Canada, so I have to do it myself. I do not believe that our children learn to manipulate us, that they have to sleep train and cry it out. I am speaking my truth. Oh, by the way, it's 20 minutes. So the oil that you smelled have gone through all your cells in your body, a trillion, a hundred trillion of them. <coughs> Let me finish what I'm going to say here. Um, 
I'm speaking my truth now because all this time I never really speak it because I feel that, you know, I'm not, never going to tell someone how to parent the children. But after learning all this, after having two teenage kids now, I tell you, my children are turning up. I, I don't know what I'm going to say yet, but I feel that I did attachment parenting with my children. I carry them in a sling. I feed them on demand and I co-sleep with them. I love for my children. It was a lot of work. I probably, my ex-husband probably left me because of that, because I took care of my children. Um, maybe one day we'll talk about attachment parenting, okay, if you want. Um, but I do know that our Delta brainwave is being developed when we were from zero to two years old. That's when your subconscious mind is being developed. So don't deprive your children of, of that. Um, but for us now, wow, well, you can't go back to the age. You're like, you're like 52 years old now. So use geranium. Geranium will open up, help you connect with what is within to what is outside to communicate. So um, so apply geranium on the PowerPoint that you want to open up. So let's say if you want to work on your heart, put geranium over your heart every single day, morning and night, Okay. And the fundamental core of reconnection is the ability to feel. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the core. This is where we are. Many of us, we are like Anna from a Frozen. We don't feel it. You don't feel it. You put it together. You put a glove on. You don't, don't just don't talk about it. Just avoid it. But the fundamental core of reconnection with others and with ourself is the ability to feel. And I would encourage you to subscribe to a 12-day text that I have put together. You need to type in the number 705-998-1818 and just type in the word feelings. So take a picture if you want, okay? You'll get 12 texts from me, one text a day to learn how to use the feelings kit, okay? So, um, and I'm so glad that we are able to reconnect with others and with ourselves. So, um, remove spotlight. Hi, everyone. Okay, I hope you um, have a, a bit of a take home. And this is recorded. I'm going to load it on YouTube and post it in our group. Um, this is an opening to many things that I have been experiencing and learning. And I feel that this is an uphill learning. A lot of us have downhill habit, but uphill dreams. This is from um, John Maxwell. You know, we don't, we, we don't discipline ourselves. We're not hungry to, to get um, better in our life. But we have downhill habit, but uphill dreams. Some people say that you have what? You have beer budget, but... Um, not whiskey. What 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 taste? Whiskey taste? What's half of this called that? They have all different ones. Yeah, they're like right. So my challenge for all of, all of us right now is: Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to pay the price to truly live the life that you are called to live? That why were you born? today in yeah champagne taste with the beer budget that's right thank you sarah all right all of us want to be this oh i want to be there oh i want to look good oh right, right you're there right but many people they work on the outer body but we are a we human we have soul spirit and body you cannot deprive your soul where your emotions are and just enlarge your body you cannot strengthen just your spirit, but let your body die. You got to work all three together, the spirit, soul, and body. You work all three together, you will be a secure personality that you are able to love and receive love. And life in the people around you are going to be so blessed. And most of all, we will live a fulfilled life. And that's where I want to be. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next week, we're going to talk about the liver meridian from the Zyto report. And then uh, maybe in the month of June onwards, we're going to go back to a lot more on this 
connection, these emotions, and how to strengthen um, our emotional spiritual connection, as well as using essential oils to strengthen our body. I tell you, members of Pure Senses are going to be so beautiful. We are going to change the world. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Hold on one second. <laughs>